You give Teller from Jerusalem 20 minutes, and he'll give you the education of a lifetime. King of the storytellers and the Shakespeare of the Torah world. Here is Rabbi Hanok Teller. Welcome back to Teller from Jerusalem for our brand new episode. Uh, I'm sorry, last time we ended off on a sad note of discussing the persecution under the czars, the pogroms, the Cantonist boys that were sent basically to their death. I wish I could end all the bad with that, but I'm afraid we have to continue with one more thing, which is a uh, story of chronologically, we could go from here straight to the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. Herzl convenes this in 1897 with the background of the dire plight of Soviet Jewry plus the background of the Dreyfus trial. But like, you know, when you go to the dentist, he or she tells you, you have some really bad dental work and there's a few other small cavities. Since we're doing the bad ones, we'll do the good ones. I never really got that. Why is it, you know, your landlord informs you, I'm going to give you a rent increase. And then does he say, since I'm already giving you a rent increase, I'll make you pay for the new intercom and also painting the hallway. But the dentists get away with this. So let me get away with one bad thing one more thing, which is somewhat very, very sad, and then we can move on, but it's going to be a real pivotal event. And here we go. Just like in daily life, you can bring about, you can be nagged and nagged. For example, your wife tells you again and again, we need burglar bars, you have to have a grill to keep the burglars out, and you put it off, you put it off, and then you have a break-in, and the next day, expeditiously, you get the burglar bars. Likewise, in history, there sometimes can be an event where things can be percolating, simmering, and then one thing happens, and that is the game changer. That's our subject for today. I'm talking about the Kishna pogrom. Located in Tsarist Russia's fertile Besabariba region, at the turn of the century, Kishna was home to about 55,000 Jews out of a population of 280,000. Mathematically, that computes to 20%. Today, that city is called Kishinau, Kishinau, if I got that correct. It's the capital of the most important city in the Republic of Moldova. And the city is not visited by tourists. I don't know why. Uh, if I have to guess, it's no different than any other Slavic country. I assume it's because it's still the curse of the Kishna pogrom. The country is wedged between Romania on one side and uh, Ukraine on the other side. Today, there are 15,000 Jews who live in Kishinev, in the very city which defined the word pogrom in the year 1903. What happened was, is a Gentile Ukrainian boy who was indisputably killed in a family dispute over inheritance uh, was found 25 miles north of Kishinev. At the very same time, a Gentile girl had committed, had poisoned herself and, was, and died in a Jewish hospital. So both of these together, this Gentile boy, this non-Jewish girl, both of them dead. So the publisher of an anti-Semitic newspaper, none other than the very publisher and editor of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which brings them to the Anti-Semitic Hall of Fame, insinuated that both children had been murdered by the Jewish community for the purpose of using their blood in preparation for matzah, for Passover. We've already discussed in earlier episodes, this is something which is impossible, is illogical for the Torah forbids again and again and again and again and again and again for a Jew to consume blood. It may not be done. And yet and yet they felt, because when you hate someone, you can describe what they do in inhuman and even in anti-human terms. So there is no newspaper that would allow itself to be outscooped when it comes to anti-Semitism. So a competing newspaper also ran a feature that these two children were murdered by the Jews because they needed their blood for Passover matzahs. So what happened was on Sunday, April 19th, 1903, Easter Sunday, there begins a pogrom in Kishinev for students. And when they see that no one is opposing them, indeed the police are encouraging them, indeed the local bishop is blessing them, things really gain traction against the Jews. And here it's probably worth quoting, as terrible as it is, Murder and massacre during the night, 50,000 Jews, which is one-third of the population, now fell prey to barbarism. A boy's tongue was cut out. Mayor Wiseman, blinded one eye from youth, begged for his life with the offer of 60 rubles. Taking this money, the leader of the mob destroyed his small grocery store, then gouged out Wiseman's other eye and said, You'll never look upon a Christian child. Nails were driven through heads. 
Bodies were hacked in half, bellies were split open and filled with feathers. One of them girls were raped, and some had their breasts cut off. In the wave of violence, beginning on Easter Day, 49 were initially murdered, 600 Jewish women were raped, 1,500 homes were damaged, and 700 homes were destroyed. 600 stores were pillaged, and there was no attempt by the police, who stood outside watching this with their arms folded to do anything to stop, to stop the pillage and plundering. The military did not intervene. It should also be noted that with all this infamy, just two years later, again in Kishinev in 1905, there was another pogrom where 19 Jews were murdered and scores and scores were injured. Now, I don't want to belabor this. We've already said more than enough. But I think it's interesting to read the stoic, never, ever interested in Jewish tragedies New York Times report. Writes to New York Times on that day, quote, The mob was led by priests in the general cry, Kill the Jews! It was taken up all over the city. Jews were taken wholly unaware and were slaughtered like sheep. The dead number 120 and injured about 500. The scenes of horror attending this massacre are beyond description. Bays were literally torn to pieces by the frenzied and bloodthirsty mob. The local police made no attempt to check the reign of terror. At sunset, the streets were piled with corpses and wounded. Those who could make their way and escape fled in terror. And the city is now practically deserted of Jews. In America, there were Jews that had come from Moldova. They felt terrible about their brethren. They wanted to know what could they do to raise money to try and assist their brethren. In New York, the rabbi of New York, the first chief rabbi, indeed the first and last and only chief rabbi of New York, Rabbi Yaakov Yosef, had suffered a stroke. He had suffered from many, many things in a very unkind population that was not supporting him. And so they were looking for a new rabbi. In Chicago was the Reed Vaz. The Reed Vaz is a combination of letters which form Rabbi Yaakov David Ben Zev Wolowski. He was the generation's greatest expert on the Jerusalem Talmud, and he made a simple geographic calculation. He also had the unique distinction of being the only rabbi to serve on three different continents. So here he is in Chicago now. His goal in life was to travel to Israel, and he figured geographically New York is on the way to Israel. He was offered the position, so he comes to fill in for Rabbi Yosef in New York. Just then was news that broke of the Kishna pogrom. The Jews in New York, not having very strong Jewish values, but they felt a sense of kinship to their brethren in Kishinev, decided they were going to raise money for them by hosting a bull. Now, to have a bull dancing, singing, food, and raise money for victims of murder and rape, it's a very bad idea. But that was their mindset. They had a problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. The problem was, is that the protocol was in those days that if you ever have a Jewish event, you invite the rabbi. But how are they going to invite the rabbi to a bull, dancing, mixed, men and women? But it was a Jewish affair. Their solution was they stuck in, it was to be held on Saturday night, they stuck the invitation under the door Friday afternoon late, assuming it would be too late for him to change his plans. And then Saturday night at the bull, at 5 to 12, the Reed Vaz walks in, <gasps> silence, a man with a long black coat, flowing gray beard. He goes over to the grandson and says, silence. And this is what the Ridvaz says. There was a Jew who was living out in the boondocks, in the, out in the woods, and he wanted to raise his child, even though he was not in a Jewish area, as a proper Jew with a correct Jewish education. So he hired a teacher known in Yiddish as a Malamid. He told this teacher, teach him anything you can to make him a proper Jew. And the farmer noticed that every single night this farmer would get down, pardon me, that the teacher would get down on the ground tip over his hat, take off his shoes, sit on the floor like a mourner, begin crying as he would say this humbo jumbo humbo bum 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 bum. He didn't know what he was saying and he could no longer contain his curiosity. One day he approached the teacher and said, tell me, what is it that you're saying every night? He said, well, the temple is destroyed. We mourn the destruction of the temple and we want it to be speedily rebuilt. So therefore we say a prayer every night at midnight that God should bless us by rebuilding the temple. And the farmer said, wow, I never heard of this before. A new commandment. Can I do this also? He said, sure. What do I have to do? Just get up at midnight, take off your shoes, sit on the floor like a mourner, and moan the destruction of the temple. And the farmer said, I can't believe it. Let's, let's drink a, a whiskey for a, and toast to life over this. No, no, no. That, that is not appropriate. But we never get a new commandment over here. No, that's not appropriate. Come on, like a little whiskey. No, no, a little, no, no. Okay. 
Now, sit down, focus. The temple is destroyed. We want to rebuild. But can we drink a little alcohol? No, it's not the right time. Okay. So he wakes him up, gets up at midnight, sits down on the floor. Come a little bit. No. Okay. He's saying the prayer. And at 3.30 in the morning, the farmer's wife wakes up and she finds the farmer and the teacher in the kitchen dancing and singing, Kishnev is destroyed, L'chayim. Let's drink a toast, L'chayim, because Kishnev is destroyed. Said the Ridvaz, the rabbi, Kishnev is destroyed, toast to life. And they stamped out. There wasn't much understanding then of how to do things the proper way. But what happened was from Kishinev, this incident focused worldwide attention on the persecution of the Jews in Russia. America and France and other countries curtailed diplomatic relations with the Russian Empire. Many, many, when this story broke, this gory story broke, many people wanted no connection with Russia, and they felt desperately that Russian jury needed an immediate solution. I'm going to give you now a contemporary footnote that should be added to the Kishna pogrom. In the initial wave, 49 Jews were murdered. It's hard to know how many subsequently perished, but we know thousands were left homeless and were maimed. According to Stanford historian Stephen Zipperstein, the Kishnev pogrom was the seeds for the formation of the Haganah in Israel and the NAACP in America. But what I find most interesting about Kishinev is that it shocked the world in the post-Nazi era. I don't think it would even elicit a yawn. Think about it. 49 people, Jews no less, are murdered and the world is up in arms. Today, I figure tens and hundreds of thousands more could not get any interest whatsoever. Stalin starved 7 million Ukrainians and millions of others throughout his country. No one talks about it. Pol Pot murdered 2 million, one third of his people. It's not an issue. This wasn't very long ago. The Russians murdered 2 million Afghans when they invaded into Afghanistan. It's not talked about. Mao Zedong, this really amazes me. Mao Zedong, between 1958 and 1962 in the Great Leap Forward, murdered at least 45 million Chinese civilians. It's not even discussed. So now, unless that's the grisly legacy of Hitler, unless you murder millions and millions, it's not an issue. Unless an Israeli soldier pulls the hair of an Arab person. Otherwise, it's never headlines. So for many Jewish leaders, Kishinev was transformative. To Herzl, uh, Kishinev was not just further evidence that the Jews desperately needed a home of their own, and he has to create it. He was having no progress with the Ottomans, so therefore, since he could not success, you know, Israel was a territory under Turkish Ottoman rule. He was getting no progress with the Ottomans. So therefore, he began looking at other locations, including Eastern Africa, which today is Uganda or Kenya. At the 6th Zionist Congress in August 1903, Herzl invoked Kishinev, referring to it not as a place and not as a time period, but rather as a condition. And this is going to be the new impetus of the Zionist movement. It starts to become extremely clear to, clear to European Jewry that as bad as life had been, it would only get worse. There had to be beginning of a mass, mass exodus. Between 1892 and 1914, some 2.5 million Jews departed Eastern Europe. During the 15 years that preceded World War I, approximately 1.3.5 million Jews left Russia, primarily the United States. So Herzl convenes the first Zionist Congress in Basel in August 1897. The delegates come from all over the world. Some of them are rich, some of them are poor. It's mostly men, some of them are women. There's a strike of the gavel, and then the most senior delegate present covered his head and recited the blessing of Sheikh Yanu. Blessed are you, Lord our God, who has kept us alive, preserved us, and enabled us to reach this moment. And now for the first time in 2,000 years, since the Romans had destroyed the Second Temple and exiled large numbers from Judea, the Jews are finally gathering in one place to deal with the future and to deal with their destiny. All gathered were determined to show that they're no longer willing to be bystanders on the stage of world history. No longer will they be just spectators. It is incorrect to say that anything more than political Zionism was launched at the First Zionist Congress because the yearning of a Jew to move back to Israel is as old as the Jewish people itself. Nothing is clear from the book of Genesis than the Jewish people's original connection to the land of Israel. As soon as we're introduced to Abraham, he's instructed, 
Go for yourself. This is in Genesis chapter 12. And here we are at the ultimate sola scriptura. Go for yourself from your land to the land that I will show you. And just a few verses later, to your offspring, I will give this land. In other words, the very idea of a promised land commences at the cradle of Jewish peoplehood. At the beginning of the book of Exodus, Pharaoh expresses his fear that the children of Israel will go up out of the land. That's Exodus chapter 1, verse 10. Pharaoh understood very well that the children of Israel were not interested in taking over Egypt or conquering his throne. What they want is to return to their ancient homeland. And that's precisely what happens as Moses leads them to the promised land. But it's not until the book of Joshua that the nation finally enters its homeland. But the lesson has been made very, very clear. It will always be a difficult and very arduous trek to get there. Now we're going to go fast forward in the Bible and find that remaining in the promised land will entail frequent wars and internal struggles. Finally, finally, under the king of David, kingdom of David, there's a stable monarchy, and that kingdom is established and passed on to his son, Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, who builds the first temple in the year 1000 BCE. The temple becomes the focal point of Jewish life, receiving Jews on three pilgrimages a year. But not only is the temple holy to the temple in Jerusalem holy to the Jews, we don't have a monopoly on this. It's holy. The first and the second temple were built there. Ultimately, the third temple will be built there. But it's also very holy to the Christian people. For we find that it was there that Jesus preached to all the poor against corruption and expelled the money changers in his famous sermon. This was supposed to be a house of prayer, not a house of cheaters. Furthermore, Jerusalem is the place where Jesus was brought as a child to be presented at the temple, to attend the festivals. And according to the Gospels, he preached and healed in Jerusalem. There's an account of Jesus cleansing the temple, chasing away various traitors of the sacred precincts. And at the end of all of the Gospels, we find that there are accounts of the Last Supper in an upper room in Jerusalem. His arrest and betrayal in Gossamane, his trial and his crucifixion in Golgotha, is his burial place, which is nearby, which is why the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the old city of Jerusalem is built over the two holiest sites in Christianity. According to Muslim belief, it's the site from where Muhammad ascended to heaven. And just like the Hebrew Bible begins with the Almighty's exhortation to Abraham to ascend to the land, the promised land, it concludes with the words that anyone to which the Lord is dear with must go up to Jerusalem to the land of Israel. Thanks for listening to Teller from Jerusalem, where this series takes an intelligent and thought-provoking look at the past in order to acquire a perspective on the present. Spread knowledge by giving us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. Join us next time for a brand new episode and be sure to visit tellerfromjerusalem.com where you can find more details about the show and other useful information. Check out the site store and just by inserting TFJ code, you'll receive an additional 10% discount off the already very reduced prices of all Hanoch Teller products, books, lectures, and documentaries. And remember, don't forget, you can get Teller from Jerusalem on any podcast platform or go to tellerfromjerusalem.com. Please see our YouTube channel for a richer than just audio experience with spiffy visual components and elements also accessible from the Teller from Jerusalem website where the list of general and specific credits are listed.